Adapted from archaic translation by W. H. D. Rouse. Jataka No. 183. Valadaka Jataka. This sorry portion, etc. This story the master told while at Jetavana Monastery, about 500 persons who ate broken meat. At Shravasti City, we learn, were 500 persons who had left the stumbling block of a worldly life to their sons and daughters, and lived all together sitting under the master's preaching. Of these, some were in the first path, some in the second, some in the third. Not a single one but had embraced salvation. They that invited the master invited these also. But they had 500 pages waiting upon them, to bring them toothbrushes, mouth water, and garlands of flowers. These lads used to eat the broken meat. After their meal, and a nap, they used to run down to the Asiravati, and on the river bank they would wrestle like very Malians, shouting all the time. But the five hundred lay brethren were quiet, made very little noise, courted solitude. The master happened to hear the pages shouting. What is that noise, Ananda? He asked. The pages, who eat the broken meat, was the reply. The master said, Ananda, this is not the only time these pages have fed on broken meat, and made a great noise after it. They used to do the same in the olden days. And then too these lay brethren were just as quiet as they are now. So saying, at his request, the master told a story of the past. Once upon a time, when Brahmadatta was king of Banaras, the Bodhisattva was born as the son of one of his courtiers, and became the king's advisor in all things both worldly and spiritual. Word came to the king of a revolt on the frontier. He ordered five hundred strong horses to he got ready, and an army complete in its four parts. With this he set out, and subdued the rising, after which he returned to Banaras. When he came home, he gave order, as the horses are tired, let them have some juicy food, some grape juice to drink. The horses took this delicious drink, then retired to their stables and stood quietly each in his stall. But there was a mass of leftovers, with nearly all the goodness squeezed out of it. The keepers asked the king what to do with that. Knead it up with water, was his command, strain through a towel, and give it to the donkeys who carry the horse's provender. This miserable stuff the donkeys drank up. It maddened them, and they galloped about the palace yard braying loudly. From an open window the king saw the bodhisattva, and called out to him. Look there! How mad these donkeys are from that sorry drink! How they bray! How they caper! But those fine thoroughbreds that drank the strong liquor, they make no noise. They are perfectly quiet, and jump not at all. What is the meaning of this? And he repeated the first stanza. This sorry portion, the goodness all strained out. Drives all these asses in a drunken move. The thoroughbreds, that drank the potent juice. Stand silent, nor skip capering about. And the Bodhisattva explained the matter in the second stanza. Dash. The low-born rustic countryman, though he but taste and try. Is frolicsome and drunken in due course of time. He that is gentle keeps a steady brain, even if he drain most potent liquor dry. When the king had listened to the bodhisattva's answer, he had the donkeys driven out of his courtyard. Then, abiding by the bodhisattva's advice, he gave alms and did good until he passed away to fare according to his deeds. When this discourse was ended, the master identified the birth as follows. At that time these pages were the five hundred asses, these lay brethren were the five hundred thoroughbreds, Ananda was the king, and the wise courtier was I myself. Source. Adapted from Archaic Translation by W. H. D. Rouse. Jataka No. 184. Giridanta Jataka. Thanks to the groom, etc. This story the master told while staying in Vilavana Park, about keeping bad company.
The circumstances have been already described under the Mahalamaka Jataka. Again, as before, the Master said. In former days this brother kept bad company just as he does now. Then he told an old story. Once upon a time, there was a king named Sama, the black, reigning in Banaras. In those days the Bodhisattva was one of a courtier's family, and grew up to be the king's worldly and spiritual advisor. Now the king had a state horse named Pandava, and one Giridanta was his trainer, a lame man. The horse used to watch him as he limped on and on in front, holding the harness. And knowing him to be his trainer, imitated him and limped too. Somebody told the king how the horse was limping. The king sent surgeons. They examined the horse, but found him perfectly sound. And so accordingly made report. Then the king sent the bodhisattva. Go, friend, said he, and find out all about it. He soon found out that the horse was lame because he went about with a lame trainer. So he told the king what it was. It's a case of bad company, said he, and went on to repeat the first stanza. Dash. Thanks to the groom, poor Pandava is in a parlous state. No more displays his former ways, but needs must imitate. Well, now, my friend, said the king, what's to be done? Get a good groom, replied the bodhisattva, and the horse will be as good as ever. Then he repeated the second stanza. Dash. Find but a fit and proper groom, on whom you can depend. To bridle him and exercise, the horse will quickly mend. His sorry plight will be set right. He imitates his friend. The king did so. The horse became as good as before. The king showed great honor to the bodhisattva, being pleased that he knew even the ways of animals. The master, when this discourse was ended, identified the birth. Devadatta was Giridanta in those days. The brother who keeps bad company was the horse. And the wise advisor was I myself. Source. Adapted from archaic translation by W.H.D. Rouse. Jataka number 185. Anapirati Jataka. Thick muddy water, etc. This story the master told while staying in Jetavana monastery, and it was about a young Brahman. A young Brahman, as they say, belonging to Shravasti city, had mastered the three Vedas, and used to teach sacred verses to a number of young Brahmins and Kshatriyas. In time he settled down as a married man. His thoughts being now busy with wealth and ornaments, serving men and serving women, lands and substance, cows and buffaloes, sons and daughters, he became subject to passion, error, wrongdoing. This obscured his wits, so that he forgot how to repeat his chants in due order, and every now and then the charms did not come clear in his mind. This man one day procured a quantity of flowers and sweet scents, and these he took to the master in Jetavana Monastery Park. After his greeting, he sat down on one side. The master talked pleasantly to him. Well, young sir, you are a teacher of the sacred verses. Do you know them all by heart? Well, sir, I used to know them all right, but since I married my mind has been darkened, and I don't know them any longer. Ah, young sir, the master said, just the same happened before. At first your mind was clear, and you knew all your verses perfectly, but when your mind was obscured by passions and lusts, you could no longer clearly see them. Then at his request the master told the following story. Once upon a time, when Brahmadatta was king of Banaras, the Bodhisattva was born in the family of a Brahman Magnifico. When he grew up, it studied under a far-famed teacher of Taxila, where he learned all magic charms. After returning to Banaras, he taught these charms to a large number of Brahman and Kshatriya youths. Amongst these youths was one young Brahman who had learned the three Vedas by heart. He became a master of ritual, and could repeat the whole of the sacred texts without stumbling in a single line. 
In due course he married and settled down. Then household cares clouded his mind, and no longer could he repeat the sacred verses. One day his teacher paid him a visit. Well, young sir, he inquired, do you know all your verses off by heart? Since, L have been the head of a household, was the reply, my mind has been clouded, and I cannot repeat them. My son, said his teacher, when the mind is clouded, no matter how perfectly the scriptures have been learned, they will not stand out clear. But when the mind is serene there is no forgetting them. And upon that he repeated the two verses following. Thick, muddy water will not show. Fish or shell or sand or gravel that may lie below. So with a clouded wit. Nor your nor others good is seen in it. Clear, quiet waters ever show. All, be it fish or shell, that lies below. So with unclouded wit. Both your and others good shows clear in it. When the master had finished this discourse, he explained the truths, and identified the birth. At the conclusion of the truths the young Brahman entered upon the fruit of the first path. In those days, this youth was the young Brahman, and I was his teacher. Source. Adapted from Archaic Translation by W.H.D. Rouse. Jataka No. 186. Daddy Vahana Jataka. Sweet was once the mango's taste, etc. This story the master told while living in Jetavana Monastery, on the subject of keeping bad company. The circumstances were the same as above. Again the master said, Brethren, bad company is evil and injurious. Why should one talk of the evil effects of had company on human beings? In days long gone by, even a vegetable, a mango tree, whose sweet fruit was a dish fit for the gods, turned sour and bitter through the influence of a noisome and bitter nymph tree. Then he told a story. Once upon a time, when Brahmadatta was reigning in Banaras, four Brahmins, brothers, of the land of Kasi, left the worldly life and became hermits. They built themselves four huts in a row in the highlands of the Himalaya, and there they lived. The eldest brother died, and was born as Saka. Knowing who he had been, he used to visit the others every seven or eight days, and lend them a helping hand. One day, he visited the eldest of the hermits, and after the usual greeting, took his seat to one side. Well, sir, how can I serve you? He inquired. The hermit, who was suffering from jaundice, replied, Fire is what I want. Saka gave him a razor axe. Opening parenthesis. A razor axe is so called because it serves as razor or as axe according as you fit it into the handle. Closing parenthesis. Why, said the hermit, who is there to get me firewood with this? If you want a fire, sir, replied Saka, all you have to do is to strike your hand upon the axe, and say, fetch wood and make a fire. The axe will fetch the wood and make you the fire. After giving him this razor axe he next visited the second brother, and asked him the same question, how can I serve you, sir? Now there was an elephant track by his hut, and the creatures annoyed him. So he told Saka that he was annoyed by elephants, and wanted them to be driven away. Saka gave him a drum. If you beat upon this side, sir, he explained, your enemies will run away. But if you strike the other, they will become your firm friends, and will surround you with an army in four times order. Then he handed him the drum. Lastly he made a visit to the youngest, and asked as before how he could serve him. He too had jaundice, and what he said was, please give me some curds. Saka gave him a milk bowl, with these words. Turn this over if you want anything, and a great river will pour out of it, and will flood the whole place, and it will be able even to win a kingdom for you. With these words he departed. After this the axe used to make fire for the eldest brother, the second used to beat upon one side of his drum and drive the elephants away and the youngest had his curds to eat. About this time a wild boar, 
that lived in a ruined village, lit upon a gem possessed of magic power. Picking up the gem in his mouth, he rose in the air by its magic. From afar he could see a small island in mid-ocean, and there he resolved to live. So descending he chose a pleasant spot beneath a mango tree, and there he made his dwelling. One day he fell asleep under the tree, with the jewel lying in front of him. Now a certain man from the Kasi country, who had been turned out of doors by his parents as a never-do-well, had made his way to a seaport, where he embarked on shipboard as a sailor's drudge. In mid-sea the ship was wrecked, and he floated upon a plank to this island. As he wandered in search of fruit, he saw a boar fast asleep. Quietly he crept up, seized the gem, and found himself by magic rising through the air. He descended on the mango tree, and thought. The magic of this gem, thought he, has taught a boar to be a skywalker. That's how he got here, I suppose. Well, I must kill him and make a meal of him first. And then I'll be off. So he broke off a twig, dropping it upon the boar's head. The boar woke up, and seeing no gem, ran trembling up and down. The man up in the tree laughed. The boar looked up, and seeing him ran his head against the tree, and killed himself. The man came down, lit a fire, cooked the boar and made a meal. Then he rose up in the sky, and set out on his journey. As he passed over the Himalaya, he saw the hermit's settlement. So he descended, and spent two or three days in the eldest brother's hut, entertaining and entertained, and he found out the virtue of the axe. He made up his mind to get it for himself. So he showed our hermit the virtue of his gem, and offered to exchange it for the axe. The hermit longed to be able to pass through mid-air, and struck the bargain. The man took the axe, and departed. But before he had gone very far, he struck upon it, and said, Axe! Smash that hermit's skull and bring the gem to me. Off flew the axe, split the hermit's skull, and brought the gem back. Then the man hid the axe away, and paid a visit to the second brother. With him the visitor stayed a few days, and soon discovered the power of his drum. Then he exchanged his gem for the drum, as before, and as before made the axe split the owner's skull. After this he went on to the youngest of the three hermits, found out the power of the milk bowl, gave his jewel in exchange for it, and as before sent his axe to split the man's skull. Thus he was now owner of jewel, axe, drum, and milk bowl, all four. He now rose up and passed through the air. Stopping hard by Benares, he wrote a letter which he sent by a messenger's hands, that the king must either fight him or yield. On receipt of this message the king swiftly moved on to seize the scoundrel. But he beat on one side of his drum, and was promptly surrounded by an army in four times order. When he saw that the king had deployed his forces, he then overturned the milk bowl, and a great river poured on. Lots were drowned in the river of curds. Next he struck upon his axe. Fetch me the king's head! cried he. Away went the axe, and came back and dropped the head at his feet. Not a man could raise hand against him. So surrounded by a mighty army, he entered the city and caused himself to be anointed king under the title of King Daddy Vahana, or carried on the curds, and ruled righteously. One day, as the king was amusing himself by casting a net into the river, he caught a mango fruit, fit for the gods, which had floated down from Lake Kanamunda. When the net was hauled out, the mango was found, and shown to the king. It was a huge fruit, as big as a basin, round, and golden in color. The king asked what the fruit was. Mango, said the foresters. He ate it, and had the stone planted in his park, and watered with milk water. The tree sprouted up, and in three years it had fruit. Great was the worship paid to this tree. Milk water was poured about it. Perfumed garlands with five bunches were hung upon it. Wreaths were festooned about it.
A lamp was kept burning, and fed with scented oil. And all round it was a screen of cloth. The fruit was sweet, and had the color of fine gold. King Daddy Vahana, before sending presents of these mangoes to other kings, used to prick with a thorn that place in the stone where the sprout would come from, for fear of their growing the like by planting it. When they ate the fruit, they used to plant the stone. But they could not get it to take root. They inquired the reason, and learned how the matter was. One king asked his gardener whether he could spoil the flavor of this fruit, and turn it bitter on the tree. Yes, the man said he could. So his king gave him a thousand pieces and sent him on his job. So soon as he had arrived in Banaras, the man sent a message to the king that a gardener was come. The king admitted him to the presence. After the man had saluted him, the king asked, You are a gardener? Yes, sire, said the man, and began to sound his own praises. Very well, said the king, you may go and assist my park keeper. So after that these used both to look after the royal grounds. The newcomer managed to make the park look more beautiful by forcing flowers and fruit out of their season. This pleased the king, so that he dismissed the former keeper and gave the park into sole charge of the new one. No sooner had this man got the park into his own hands than he planted nims and creepers about the choice mango tree. In due course of time the nims sprouted up. Above and below, root with root, and branch with branch, these were all entangled with the mango tree. Thus this tree, with its sweet fruit, grew bitter as the bitter-leaved nimb tree by the company of this noxious and sour plant. As soon as the gardener knew that the fruit had gone bitter, he took to his heels. King Daddy Vahana went for walking in his garden, and took a bite of the mango fruit. The juice in his mouth tasted like a nasty nimb. Swallow it he could not, so he coughed and spat it out. Now at that time the Bodhisattva was his worldly and spiritual advisor. The king turned to him. Wise sir, this tree is as carefully cared for as ever, and yet its fruit has gone bitter. What's the meaning of it? And asking this question, he repeated the first stanza. Dash. Sweet was once the mango's taste, sweet its scent, its color gold. What has caused this bitter flavor? For we tend it as of old. The Bodhisattva explained the reason in the second stanza. Dash. Round about the trunk entwining, branch with branch, and root with root. See the bitter creeper climbing. That is what has spoilt your fruit. And so you see bad company will make the better follow suit. On hearing this the Bodhisattva caused all the nims and creepers to be removed, and their roots pulled up. The noxious soil was all taken away, and sweet earth put in its place. And the tree was carefully fed with sweet water, milk water, scented water. Then by absorbing all this sweetness its fruit grew sweet again. The king put his former gardener in charge of the park, and after his life was done passed away to fare according to his deeds. After this discourse was ended, the master identified the birth, in those days I was the wise advisor.